Time for the Glitter Boom Girls Show. I'm Robbie Ann McPherson, and 3,000 miles away from me on the West Coast is Amy Asbury. Amy, what's up? How are you? Is that is that passe now? What's up? That's old, right? No, I'll, you know what? I'll say whatever I want, and you should say whatever you want. Right? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm down with that. Is that old, too? Okay. You know what? I'm just going to... let's. I, I call them antique words. Right? Like words like terrific. No one says terrific anymore. I love that word terrific. Right? And I love the word fantastic. And I love the word marvelous. Yeah. Marvelous. Yeah. That, you know what? That's darling. That Isn't that marvelous? Darling is a beautiful word. That is terrific. That is terrific. Yeah, I love it too. Um, so today we are continuing because you cannot do it in one episode. We are continuing our conversation about disco um and uh we talked already about disco music and we covered of course the Bee Gees in our last episode which you can find on our podcast page um and today we're gonna get into like the culture the pop yes. culture um and uh amy why don't why don't you like uh kick it off you know like give me Give me your, like when someone says disco, boom, what pops into your head? I'm going to say it's the first thing I think of is dancing. But other than that, I think of really bright color. I think of the sets from the background of, you know, the Brady Bunch variety show where it's orange and yellow and gold. I think of this certain look. Even my Barbies had the same look. I I picture DJs. Suddenly there was all these remixes and I just picture, um, this certain little funk that kind of spread into every background music of every doctor's office, every elevator, every TV show. It was, it was color and it was just that little twinky twinky. What's that? What instrument is that? I don't even know. The Keyboard? Wah, 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 wah. Yeah. Everything kind of just became like funky. Yeah, so they, I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but they call it, it the... really changed the world. It changed the world and everybody felt, they had to put out a disco album to be current. They call that the wah-wah pedal. The wah-wah pedal. And, you know, in the background of some of my TV shows, suddenly any character who was of age was kind of going out to the disco just to show, like, hey, we know what's going on in the world. <laughs> so, you know, it's just... Uh, and I think of eight is enough, believe it or not, because I think of all of their hair. Every female cast member on eight is enough their hair was ready to go to the disco, I feel like. Oh, yeah. One side was up and one side was down and, you know. Yeah, so. Mary Mary was older. She was. She had sort of the short... She she was a little bit... I'm going to say Elizabeth's hair was ready to go. Elizabeth Elizabeth was ready to go. Um, Nancy was ready to go for Nancy, sure. She always had like the ruffles. Nancy was ready to go. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nancy had... She, she would wear the halter tops and uh-huh. she had the feather she was pretty um, and then Su- was it susan with the red flip yeah hair? susan she- well and susan always had those weird um pigtails and barrettes and stuff i could picture her though putting on some satin really tight pants and a sequin outfit and kind of like yeah glossing up yes i don't know mary was too responsible to go out yeah. to a disco but the rest of them and I'd mary was Abby serious would even go she was like political and serious Right. I don't know that Mary, you know, was into that. And then was Joni the one with a little like Dorothy Hamill kind of, not Dorothy Hamill, but the. Yeah, Joni was serious too. Joni yeah. was like, yeah, I don't. Joni might have found herself at a disco, like if she was out with a group of girls for some reason. Yeah. But you get the feeling she would have been the one sitting at the table watching the purses. She would have watched the purses and she would have called Abby to come pick them up when they were too drunk. Right. Exactly. But Abby, I think Abby would have shaken her booty. I think Abby was I down. So. so I feel like that cast definitely kind of, I mean, I don't think of disco and I think of it is enough, but I just, that hair and I just feel like certain shows definitely had the, the look of, and, and you know, what's also funny. A lot of TV shows, maybe chips, for instance, mm-hmm. kind of at the end of the show when they were going out, 
or even Bionic Woman, you know, they kind of went out at the end and the credits started to go. They'd be at a disco or the bowling alley or, you know. Yeah, the, like they would be, that's where they had like the chuckle about whatever it was at the end and they'd like clink the glasses about. And then it would, st- and then it would freeze frame on yeah. them like laughing. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> And it was always the what? same bar. Like they only went to the one bar, <laughs> like Charlie's, you know. So. Or- was Three's company, because I feel like they should have been doing the most disco dancing, Were no. they, was that 70s or 80s? Well, that, that, 70s, that, right? that went into the 80s, if I recall. Okay. But it started um, out, you know, were yeah, they disco dancing a bit? I don't remember. Now, listen, I, I think I've probably seen every Three's company episode, but um, I don't think they ever were at a disco. Um what about I... Charlie's Angels, though? What about Charlie's Angels? Oh, yeah. Charlie's Angels had... Well, I remember there was like a roller boogie. Oh, or, or I mean yeah. a roller derby episode. And uh, I'm sure there was a disco. I see that now. Thing. I mean, can you imagine? You have you have three women. No matter which cast you're talking about, you have three women that gorgeous. You know, you're going to put them in a disco outfit at some point. So... And, and I feel like they were already wearing tube tops the majority of the time. They're actually, I guess, in, apparently in season three, episode 16, there was an episode called Disco Angels. Well, it, there you it go. It aired January 31st, 1979. Perfect. So get this. Are you ready for this? I don't think a so. disco owner concocts an alibi after a man he argued with becomes the latest victim in a string of murders. What? So yeah. <laughs> so, and yeah, so wait, that's awesome. let me guess. They go undercover <laughs> right? in the disco, right? I think so. Now, I don't and that, know. wait, what season was, did you say that was? So that was season three, episode 16. Season I think three. you guys So wait, now go. let me guess. I want to guess. All right. Season yeah. three would have been yeah. Kate Jackson, Jacqueline Smith, and. Cheryl Ladd? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Or, or would I can't it have been Shelly Hack? I think you're right. All I see here. Oh, so who was Chris? Who played Chris? Cheryl Ladd? Chris was. Wait, yeah. Chris was Cheryl KRS? Ladd. Yeah. Okay, so it was Cheryl Ladd. So, so listen to this. When the angels are summoned to investigate a strangulation it leads them to the popular freddy's disco <laughs> where they go under cover yes. freddy's so anyway, yeah freddy's, freddy's disco. The, the hot spot that was the hot spot freddy's disco so freddy's you know disco. i need to see so kelly was in it so we know jacqueline smith was in it mm-hmm. and, and kate uh, was in all of them so kate was in all of them yeah you can't get another kate do you know i met kate jackson once Oh, <gasps> yes, that is the appropriate reaction. Um, I I went to a broadcasting school in uh, 2007 to kind of refresh my broadcasting skills because I, I know everyone's going to be shocked, but I actually have a degree in this stuff. And I, no shock here. I, <laughs> I'm sure our listeners are like, what? You know, but um, anyway, so she she oh, was going to do a, a um, uh, something like mm-hmm. she I think she, I think she was going to work on something with someone or, or do a radio show like a serious XM thing or something like that. So she came in um, to the to the school and I happened to be manning the front desk for a minute. And wow. I was like, you know, I'm just I'm just standing there at the front desk. And this was not a place where famous people came in you know so I'm just sitting there and I'm like dum-de-dum and it was like and and in 2007 this woman looked exactly like she did on tv like she was totally beautiful you know it it, it was like I heard the music you know Uh and she just walks in and she's like hi um may I speak to someone about you know classes and and I'm like uh uh uh, and I'm like, you're Whoa. you're Kate Jackson, aren't you? <laughs> She's like, yes, I am. I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> like I 
was all starstruck. I love that. Oh, she was I so love sweet. love that. Yeah, so I ran and I got the, and everyone was all like fumbling over themselves. Like, oh my God, oh my God. So um, she uh, went and talked to the school director and, and stuff. But uh, yeah, I was, I mean, just stupefied, stupefied. But you know what? We're digressing. So I, I love it. I love it. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, I've, I've rubbed elbows. You know, living in LA for thirteen years, as I did, I've rubbed elbows with a lot of famous people, as you have, right? Because well, you know, I mean, you still live in in the LA area, um, yeah. but the people that you get the most thrill out of crossing paths with are, you know, like like your childhood TV oh. eras or or like when I saw Sean Cassidy in Whole Foods. Oh my god. I mean, I was in my 30s and I almost I, I mean, I I couldn't even speak. I I just he's he was like checking out, you know, <laughs> boop, you I know, with the food, that. boop, <laughs> the register and I was like <gasps> Oh, you know. that is so lovely. I love that. It's right. so cool. Yeah, it's fun. Who, what, what celebrity has ever made you like trip out? Cause you know, I know we've waited on them and if people want to figure out how we met, check out our pilot episode. Um, we, we used to be, um, waiters, um, at, uh, at a quote unquote famous deli. But, um, Oof. what, uh, what famous person have you ever like seen or crossed paths with that tripped you out? Um, you know, it, at that particular deli, keeping with the theme, I did see, Maureen McCormick. Get out. Um, and I did see, yeah, Marsha came in. Greg also came in. Yeah, I waited on Greg once too. Nice yeah. man. Very was, nice Was Marsha nice? She was just a nice woman, of course. Yeah. And you know, um, Rick James was always in there. Yeah, you know, he's buried here in Buffalo. Is that right? Yeah, he's from here. Yeah, in fact, I went for a walk the other day right by his gravestone. He is a fantastic oh, gravestone. Yeah. That's well, I'm glad to hear that he's been properly represented. Right. Um, yeah, a lot of 70s icons. And, um, you know, this goes into the 80s. But the one armed drummer from Def Leppard, that was one of my favorites. I was very and some Fleetwood Mac members. I was very uh, excited. Yeah. Oh, that's trippy. Because, yeah, you know, the the rock icons, you know, because they're always they're a little mysterious. Like rock stars are just rock stars are. I don't know. That's crazy. But yeah. anyway, okay, back yeah. to the disco. Like we're, yeah. we, I mean, that's important stuff, but like disco is, um, you know, that's gravitas. Like this is, this yeah. is important discussion here. Um, yeah, very important. So, so Chips also had um, a disco related episode because one of the things that spawned off of disco music was roller disco. <laughs> and Chips had this disco episode uh. Um, which featured Melissa Sue Anderson from Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> and wow. um, there were a lot of those kind of like uh, cultural, um, what is mm -hmm. it? It's, it's like um, bloodletting or something, you know, where someone would be, you know, you picture these guys with cigars in the TV boardrooms going, we, we got to have a disco show, you know? Uh, that, totally. That disco thing is hot. Let's, let, we got we to do a disco thing, you know? So totally. Yeah. yeah. And you know, Melissa Sue Anderson and uh Melissa Gilbert were of course both on the love boat, speaking of such things. Oh yeah. Who wasn't on the love well, boat? Well, yeah. Right? Yeah. I loved the love boat. Is it of course. I, I gotta see um in fact that you know, that's a good like binge show. I gotta I gotta see what's up with the love boat on the on the binge show. Um that every Saturday night, you know, I would I would take my shower and stuff when I was a little kid, and get my jammies and watch oh, the Love Boat. That those are really good memories. Total. Albert, I remember Albert was on it also as Chip Bronson, <laughs> and he like fell and had some kind of something happen to him. But yeah, such a good idea. That is definitely if you want to see. You know what? I feel like there was a couple of agents that were like. Hey, all of your clients can be on our show. You know, there was some kind of deal going on, probably. Yeah, yeah. It's like a, like a package. Like if you did this and this, the mm -hmm. you also did a Love Boat episode. That also, Absolutely. You know. Yeah, like I think Love Boat was like the law and order of, you know, the 70s and early 80s. Because a lot of people, 
cycled through Law and Order, you know, because it had eight million episodes and eight million. You're right. But You're right. Um, I loved the Love Boat. That that was a that was a it was a a am um. Well, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a friendly, sweet show, you know. And I wonder if they had a disco episode. Oh, oh come on! You know. They did have like a disco party. I feel like I feel like the Love Boat theme was actually mixed as a disco song. I, I feel like I've heard it on the dance floor before. Well, the pilot episode used Love's theme um, from Barry White's Love Unlimited Orchestra. <laughs> you know, um, that instrumental. And then the subsequent like seasons used the Love Exciting and New. You know, they, they use that um, kind of um variation of the theme but yeah so so and i think that qualifies as a disco tune you know that instrumental talk about wah 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 pedal right and then you throw in Kristen nickel and scott bayo and some sandy duncan oh god and charlene tilton and you know yeah i mean that's kind of a good question like when someone says disco to me Mm -hmm. um the first thing that i think of is uh you know is the music like but i'm i'm a music kind of focused person so i i think of the music but if someone says 70s to me yeah the first thing i think of is disco so like you know like some other people if you say 70s they might think of classic rock right or you know or they True. they think of uh some you know i don't know um what what Cat a, Stevens or Van Morrison or some folk yeah thing. yeah yeah exactly like um the tail end of all that stuff or, or or the political unrest and you know coming out of the 60s you know all that stuff but yeah, true since I was a child of the 70s I I I tend to think of tv but I, w- I was raised by a pack of wild tvs I always say that you because... were you were and and you know what back to what you were saying about chips the roller disco episode is considered the most 70s scene in 1970s TV, which makes me laugh. Oh, really? And um, Todd Bridges is in there as a little kid. Todd Melissa Bridges. Sue Anderson. So this Todd was like Bridges. an all-star cast episode, like a very special Chips episode. It looks like a very a very special Chips episode. Um, Melissa Sue Anderson, Cindy Williams, um, you know, a Cindy bunch of people. Cindy Williams? Now that Cindy she was a big Williams. star in 1979. Dana Shirley. Plato, I'm looking at right now. Oh, you guys, Victor French from Little House in his normal clothes. Oh, you guys got to get and watch this. Yeah. I'm oh, I'm pulling that up on YouTube Susan as soon as Susan from we're done. 8 is enough. I just saw <gasps> in the background. I'm so excited. And what were we just saying about I'm how telling disco you, worthy somebody... she was? So they're on roller skates trying to go down like a, a soul train line on roller skates so i would say 70s reminds me of roller skating a lot so disco roller disco yeah i'm gonna, I'm gonna go with that yeah it's so um it's such a happy thing um i think that's kind of an interesting uh difference probably between kids in the 70s and adults in the 70s like if you talk to adults you know they're going to talk about gas lines and you know watergate and and all this stuff and for a kid like me i'm gonna remember um you know chips and love boat and the bgs and sean cassidy and stuff like that it's totally different to me but also the soundtrack like disco is happy right it's this happy um uh positive music and it's groovy makes you want to get up and dance and it it's not it's not like um folk music or navel gazing music or something that makes you think seriously about serious things yeah right like you know absolutely the songs are like (laughs) i mean the songs are like you should be dancing (laughs) you know Uh, no parking baby on the dance floor (laughs) like that's it man that's all you gotta worry about you're right (laughs) 100 percent. yeah so um, we're going to take a short break. Uh, we're a little late with the break right now, but um, we'll be right back after this. We're the Glitter Boom Girls. This podcast brought to you by Taking Liberty, a novel. 
by Robbie Ann McPherson. 30-something Maggie can't find the courage to leave her cruel boyfriend or her miserable life in Montana. Fate intervenes, and with the help of three strangers, Maggie finally escapes. But her new start leads her right back to the childhood home and the old mistakes she never thought she'd have to face again. Taking Liberty, available on Kindle and on paperback on Amazon.com and Barnes & Noble. And we're back after the break. Um, we're the Glitter Boom Girls. Thanks for joining us. We're talking about disco and culture in uh, the 1970s and early 80s and the whole effect that the disco had on the culture. Um, so let's talk about like 70s disco versus 80s disco. I don't even know if I can differentiate. You're going to have to tell me what you think about that. Well, no, I, I think you I think you will. You just don't know it. Like, okay, okay 80s disco. Think flash dance, right? What a feel. Oh, that's right? 80s disco? Um, you know, get down on it. Okay, get that, that, that. Pointer Sisters, um, Let It Whip, Shaka Khan, Shaka, Shaka, Shaka I, Khan, okay, so Shaka I, Khan. I draw the line. Nothing past 1983 to me is disco. So I draw the line at Flashdance and Shaka Khan. I feel like those are going into like the breakdancing thing. And yeah. I draw such a strict line. Yeah, I, I agree. I I would have to say that I think that's our that's our border is 1983 slash four. I think you're right. Because oh, yeah. once you I, get yeah. into like when doves cry and stuff like that, you know, it's over. Like that's that's just not disco. But I mean, I feel for you. That is a disco tune. You think so? I guess I just when he was doing the Shaka Khan, everybody, everybody Shaka Khan. To me, that was like okay, that's rap. Baby, so baby, that goes, when all I the kids would you. break dance to that where I'm from. So to me, that goes to, in the break dancing basket. Maybe that's a that's transitional song. That's just my head. Like a transitional rug. Maybe maybe I feel for you uh, was like the transitional song. I will, you know, one also, foot in the yes. disco and world. And it was written by Prince, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? And and Prince, I mean, of all people who could cover, you know, disco and, he, I mean, Prince was so cool. No matter what he did, he, you know, he 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 could just float anywhere he wanted to. He, you know, he was sure. funk. Yes. Um, and I don't know. Some funk songs seem disco-y to me, and vice versa. So. Um, I think that's a whole. Funny. He um, he did have his own version of "I Feel for You" in 1979, and it was really kind of disco-y. And then hers came out in '84. Yeah. So, so after point. Well, and then she also had um, uh, what was the other? What was her other? Um, I'm every oh, woman. Oh well, she had to me something good with Rufus. Wow, like she had some I old. Know. Yeah, and but I like, like I'm every disco. woman. That's a disco tune. Like if you listen right. to the beat, right? I mean, that's full okay. on disco. You know, yeah. you're right. I'm every um, but also mm. '80s disco is it's raining men. Total disco tune. Okay, I think okay. that was like '83, '82, '83. Um, definitely. So, but it, definitely. I wonder what, I wonder what makes the cut off the cut off, right? Like who decided in 1983 or four to just close the door on that sound? Like, was it technology and recording where these artists and producers just started, um, uh, discovering, um, different ways to record and drum machines and new sounds and you know stuff like that or do you think it was the palette of the consumers like why did disco die well i think that it has something to do with maybe the lack of people going out dancing and maybe the rise of the yuppie of the person who's trying to go to work and be on wall street and maybe kind of contradicted with that but i'm not sure because i'm sure a lot of yuppies did a ton of coke and went out dancing yeah they well yeah they went out dancing for sure but they were dancing to like depeche mode and stuff that was the new wave so new I wave think... replaced disco but why like it's both dance music like what i don't get it 
I don't, you know, because you could you could play, you could mix up disco and new wave all night, and I'd be like, whatever, you know, like I don't care. But I just found it so weird, even back then when I was young, I found it so strange that um, disco became so passe just so suddenly. And then it was like, nope, now we're listening to this new kind of electronic sound and that's it. You know what? I really think it's when people's parents started going out to do it because that kills everything. Oh, you got it. I think that's it. when you are like, have your own slang and it's cute and then it starts showing up on TV commercials, you're like, okay, that's dead. Yeah. That was supposed to be for me and my friends. Yep. And then a year later, your parents are trying to say it and they're trying to dress up. And when they go out and it becomes too mainstream, there is a screeching sound of tires, a screech from the needle scratching the record. Once your parents get into it, it's dead. Yeah. And I think you're right that Hal and Gordon at the record company, oh, well, I think we should get into this disco thing. I think that happened and every kid rejected it. You're right. I think we could trace it back to the moment when those infomercials for the dance <laughs> lesson yes. videos started uh -huh. airing. And the, yep. and like your parents started buying them and it was like, mm -hmm. oh, let's learn. Yeah, I, th I think I think that's true. And when the 18 year olds who were populating the discos in like 77, 78, 79, when they turned, you know, 23, 24, they were outgrowing like everybody does, right? You sort of outgrow what you were into. Whatever it, you were into. It could have been yeah. the coolest thing. It is now passe. Right. Yeah. Like, because I'm you're not three years like older. That. I mean, I, I, I still, was. no, I, I, I still listen to like Sean Cassidy, a record I bought when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. I still listen to that damn record now. Like it's in rotation. Well, now. And, but let's be honest, when you were back at the record store with your new Madonna things, were you really thinking about Sean Cassidy when you had your new Madonna record? As God is my witness, yes. Okay. I had mixtapes okay. with like, and my mixtapes, it was like Judas Priest, Madonna, <laughs> um, Ray Charles, Sean Cassidy, Barry Manilow, um, you know, some weird punk band. Like I... I was all over the place, totally all over the place. Okay. So it, I didn't quite understand um, the music, but with clothes and stuff, I can totally relate. Cause like things that I wore <laughs> or try, wait, let me rephrase that. Things I tried to wear. <laughs> Cause I, I'm such a fashion failure. I just, I. You know, you always say that. And then every picture I see of you is adorable. I. No, I, I, that's a, that's a lie. <laughs> You're just straight up lying right now. Cause that's just, that's a pitiful lie. I'm not going to argue with you, but I always <laughs> think you look so good. Compared to, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I couldn't like, I was the one where, you know, the Bastad clogs were really hip and they, they peaked in like 1977 I got them in 79, you know, um, mm -hmm. the, the lace up knee high boots with the chunk heel, they peaked in 78. I got them in 80, you know, <laughs> like that. that's, I mean, I feel like that's, that's middle America. I mean, who is that chic? <laughs> Everybody Except else around my, me was that chic. Every school person in my town was, but yeah, maybe it was the people I hung out with. I don't know. Yeah. So, well, and speaking of all that, um, within the disco fashion, because that's a whole ball of wax there, right? You had, um, like, you had like the Soul Train disco, you know, which is probably the coolest disco. I mean, everything about Soul Train is just way cool. But you know, there was like midriff look with the um, like bell bottoms and lots of earth tones, you know, and and um, they had like a lot of leather shoes and platforms and stuff. And then you had like the, um, you know, American bandstand disco, which was like tacky as hell and people in mismatched shit and polyester and, you know, just like wacky stuff. And if you look at Saturday Night Fever, there was not a lot, you know, no sequins. You know, it was not sequins. It you're was right. like you're right. Yeah, it was like 
the guys all had patterned shirts. You know, they all had these weird prints on them. And the women all had solids that were like pastels and stuff. Yes. Remember? Like yes. Annette always, you know, Annette was always in pastels. And uh, Stephanie, they had her in white a lot. And um, I think I think once she was in yellow or something. And that powder I blue bodysuit. I think it kind of just went mainstream. The clothes kind of went from the cool people wearing them to like, let's make copies of those clothes from Saturday Night Fever and put them in Sears. You know, that kind of takes away from it. Yeah. And I think that like when Urban Cowboy came out, it was just a whole like, hey, let's look over here, you know, with those little 70s shirts with the puff sleeves and the kind of game. I don't know. I just feel like there was just a little shift, maybe led by movies, maybe the overexposure of Saturday Night Fever and those clothes going mainstream and the infomercials. Yeah. And then the early 80s. You know, let's not forget MTV, right? I mean, MTV came out August 1st, 1981, and everyone was exposed to crazy stuff. And all of a sudden, everybody's taking fashion cues, not from New York Good Fashion point. Week, right? But Good they're, point. Yeah, all of a sudden, it was like Pat Benatar's wearing Take these- Take your pick. Yeah, like crazy skin-tight leather pants and a weird striped shirt. And, and rags tied to her arms. And yeah, I mean, right. And and we, every video was different. Well, right? you know what I see that as? I see that as, hey, guys, music is now visual. Let's be the craziest we can be. Let's win this game. And they're all kind of elbowing each other for the consumer. Yeah. So yeah. like Duran Duran, we're going to just dunk you in a thing of red and black spikes and rags and Right, headbands. Tiger stripes. David Lee Roth, you're over here. Cindy Lauper, you're over here. And everybody was like, okay, this is in color. This is going to be visual. What's the absolute nuttiest, craziest, eye-catching thing we can do? Yeah. You know, and then we all watch it. We're like, oh, wow, we can pick any one of these. Like, wait a second. Whoa, 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 you know? Yeah, like, oh, I, I would look terrible in that. But this over here, you know, I was all about the Madonna borderline mm -hmm. that – that oh. uh, street urchin look it was great yeah it was I mean, just great yeah it was so i still i watched that video and it was it was so all those early videos were so impactful um remember kim wilde um of course right uh the kids in america she had that blazer with the blue stripes and that she had that messy blonde hair i mean i think for the last 35 40 years i've been trying to replicate that look <laughs> I Why? love I that not look. Know what about you? I mean, she, you know, but she had the smudgy eyeliner and stuff. Just so, so cool. Just cool. Period. Right. Something I'll I probably just... never be. You gotta stop saying that because he. No, you, no. I, I mean, know. I'm I okay with it. Like, I, I, I'm not saying it. Like, it's. I'm fine with being cool. I'm proud okay, that fine. I'm not cool. You know, I'm laughing at it because I look back. And I was tortured over it when I was a little kid. And I, that might be why I was so in love with disco when I was little. Because I, I, saw, um, I saw all that disco stuff as something cool. And I, I aspired to be that when I grew up. I thought disco would still be around when I was an adult. And I couldn't wait to like go to the clubs and you know learn all the steps and be... Um, you know stephanie or whatever and annette not annette but like you know yeah and i i just thought that um i thought that that was cool and and then you know you you see other things on tv um like all those videos and you know like the kim wilde thing i mentioned and um you or, or madonna like something about madonna when she just exploded on the scene she was so cool there was just something about her that was so totally self-possessed i guess is the she word just did not care and anybody right? who i ever looked up to there was some element of like i really don't care what you think <laughs> and that was definitely yeah yeah because you know when, when you're young like that you care what everybody thinks so much 
and and you're so you know and, and then but again it goes back to like the theme of the songs I mean you put you put on um Thelma Houston don't leave me this way right or you put on Gloria Gaynor I will survive you put on it's raining men you know Ooh. it's all attitude you know tall blonde like you know what when you put on those songs and you're getting ready to go out yes they give you like this power Uh uh-huh it's the best music to get ready to go out to even if you're going out to like the ballet like you put on disco to get ready right put your makeup on absolutely yeah yeah i i like i like disco to um wash the dishes and clean the house and same you know right and or if if i am feeling um, like fogged out, you know, you get that brain fog. Like to me, disco is a good antidote to brain fog. It just kind of, cause all of a sudden you're toe tapping and you know, you're in, you're, it's like you're in your own video all of a sudden you're like, what a feeling, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. It's, it's just so much fun. And you know what else I love about it? Just side note. I don't have to sit there and try to be deep and try to look at the, the deeper meaning Oh, yeah. I don't have to go, wow. You, you know, I don't have to think about anything. Well, it's just the beat. That is a fantastic point. Um, no, it really is. Because, like, you and I both have been through some shit, you know, in our lives. Like, we have overcome some shit, not unlike many people who are listening right now. Certainly, yes. And when you've been through some shit, you, you don't need to contemplate your navel you don't need to get in touch with your depth and all that you've already stood at the abyss and you've already you know you've already figured all that stuff out so you don't necessarily need it in your art like in music and movies and all that kind of stuff you you want to escape you want to get in touch with joy you want to get in touch with feeling good or positive or you want something that lifts you up and when I like when I was a kid um I, I had a pretty good childhood up to a point, but there was a point where, you know, some shit went down. And mm-hmm. when you get there, you want to escape. And then, you know, now as an adult, disco either lifts me up because I remember it lifted me out of something when I was a kid, or I remember it was the soundtrack to a happy time, right? That's right. And again, like we said on a different episode, it's kind of a memory stamp. You hear that music and your brain maybe brings back that dopamine or the serotonin or whatever. And you get that same little hit, that same little feeling you had when you felt good. Yeah, 100%. Wow. We love disco. Wow. We really did. Yeah. Aim, we're out of time. What? I know. I know. Man, we can talk. Mm-hmm. We can. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so everyone should know Amy Asbury is a ridiculously fantastic author of many, many, many books. Um, and uh, you should check out her stuff. You can find us on Twitter, Glitter Boom Girl Show. And uh, my name is Robbie Ann McPherson, also an author. Um, our books are available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and Kindle. What were you going to say, Aim? I was going to say you have a fantastic, fantastic book that should be a movie. I guarantee you it will be on Lifetime. It's called Taking Liberty. So read it. Let me know. Taking Liberty by Robbie Ann McPherson. You can Google it, search it. Um, If you're listening to this podcast on YouTube, um, there's links all over the place. So, And uh, you know what? Hit us up on Twitter. We love DMs and we we talk back. So um, thanks for listening. And uh, we will see you next time on the Glitter Boom Girl Show.